Welcome, everyone. I'm Donna McPhee. I graduated from Columbia College in 1989, and I'm the Vice President for Alumni Relations and President of the Columbia Alumni Association. And we're so glad you've joined us today for Columbia at Home. You're really in for a special treat. Today's program will take us behind the scenes of a new off-Broadway musical. Its opening was postponed due to the pandemic, but we're glad to be able to share some of it with you and let you hear from its creators. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in that time we have. If you're interested in more arts programming, be sure to sign up for CAA Arts Access. You can learn more about the program at alumni.columbia.edu. Our moderator tonight will be Rita, Rita Pietro Pinto Kitt. Rita is the chair of the drama department at Marymount School of New York. She is also an adjunct professor in the Barnard Theater Department, where she teaches undergraduate acting classes. As an actress, Rita has performed on Broadway, off Broadway, and in television and film. She is a board member for the Lilies and a trustee for the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. Rita received a BA in political science from Columbia College in 1993, served as her senior class president, and participated in the varsity show as an actress and producer for four years. She also received an MFA in acting from Columbia School of the Arts in 1996. Her Columbia volunteer leadership includes many um, opportunities, especially serving as the first woman to be chair of the Columbia Alumni Association. She was past chair of the CAA Arts Access Committee. She is vice president for the Columbia College Alumni Association. And we have also recognized Rita for her contributions to Columbia with a 2016 Alumni Medal and the Community Impact Award in 2018. I am now pleased to welcome a dear friend and fellow Colombian, Rita Pietro Pinto Kitt to Columbia at Home. Well, thank you, Donna, so much. I'm so happy to be here uh, today and uh, to join Columbia for this event. Um, so yes, March 12th, 2020 is a day that everybody in the performing arts community will remember. It's when Broadway shut down and so many wonderful productions. And uh, one of those productions, uh, as you said, was scheduled to open later in the month, uh, The Visitor at the Public Theater. So I'm gonna give a, a quick introduction um, from the public to this amazing new show that is just on pause for right now, um, but this soul-stirring new musical was scheduled to open at the public this past spring with heart, humor, and lush new songs by uh, Columbia alumni and Pulitzer Prize and Tony winning team, Tom Kitt and Brian Yorkey, who you may know from Next to Normal and If Then. And joining them on their art artistic team is uh, Kwame Kwe Arme, uh, the artistic director of London's Young Vic, and of course, from the Public Works Twelfth Night. Um, they adapted this acclaimed independent film by Thomas McCarthy into a new musical. So the story of it um, is about a professor, a college professor named Walter. He's widowed and he's living alone and his life has lost a sense of purpose. Um, one day he comes home to discover two young undocumented immigrants that are living in his New York apartment. And they are the drummer Tarek and uh, his wife, the jewelry maker Zenab. And Walter finds himself in the middle of a battle to stay in an America that's lost its better angels. Now this was written, you can imagine, even before um, you know the, the pandemic hit us. Um, it's a very emotional and beautiful story. And um, we're happy to share a quick clip of The Visitor right now with all of you. Just put your heart, put your heart, just put your heart. Put 
Thank you so much uh, for that little little taste of, of the visitor. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest today. Um, so with us today is uh, Tom Kitt, um, who I know well. Um, he's Columbia College class of 1996, and he composed the music for the visitor. Um, he won the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for Drama and Tony Awards for Best Score and Best Orchestrations for Next to Normal. He is also the composer of Almost Famous, Flying Over Sunset, If Then, High Fidelity, Bring It On the Musical, Superhero at Second Stage, and Disney's Freaky Friday. Other Broadway credits as an orchestrator, arranger, include Jagged Little Pill, uh, Head Over Heels, The SpongeBob Musical, and American Idiot. He received an Emmy Award as co-writer with Lin-Manuel Miranda for the 2013 Tony Award opening number, Bigger. And while at Columbia, he sang with the Kingsmen and wrote the scores for the 100th and 102nd Varsity shows. He received the Alumni Medal of Excellence at Columbia University in 2012 and the John Jay Award in 2019 and was honored with the Community Impact Award for Outstanding Community Service in 2018. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Uh, also, Thank you. Jo <laughs> also joining us, uh, Kwame, Kwa I'm sorry, Kwame Kwe Arma, uh, co-wrote the book for The Visitor. He is an actor, playwright, director, and broadcaster. In 2018, he was made artistic director of the Young Vic in London. As a playwright, his credits include Tree, One Love, uh, Beneath His Place, Elma's Kitchen, Fix It Up Statement of Regret, Let There Be Love and Seize the Day. Uh, Kwame was artistic director for the Festival of Black Arts and Culture, Senegal in 2010. He conceived and directed the opening ceremony at Senghor National Stadium. He was an associate director of the Donmore Warehouse and has served on the boards of the National Theater, Tricycle Theater, and Theater Communications Group. Um, and he's joining us from London tonight. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, he was also the Chancellor of the University of Arts London from 2010 to 2015. And in 2012 was awarded an OB for services to drama. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Tom and Kwame. Thank you, good to be here. Thanks for having us. So um, we're gonna start with a couple of questions before we go to our audiences. Um, and I'd like to begin um, by asking you about this very unique time that we're in. Um, the visitor was set to go into performances on March 24th. Uh, you were in rehearsals uh, March 12th when we had the shutdown, um, just as the city locked down all performances and performing arts. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your experiences uh, with that, what it was like to be in rehearsal knowing that um, this climate was about to change um, you know, what it felt like when you were told you had to postpone and, um, you know, how it's been so far um, as artists um, working through this very challenging time. Uh, you well, go first, Tom. Um, well, first, I just want to thank Columbia and, and for this um, wonderful chance to talk about the visitor. And, and it's a, a great excuse for me to see my friend Kwame, who, I don't. I haven't seen since since uh, he left rehearsal and was and was going back to to London. Uh, so um, this is wonderful, and also as as you can imagine, is is emotional. Um, I uh, I started to track what was going on, and I, I think about the rehearsal room because that's where I was on the New York Times website, beginning to get a sense as to how the virus was making its way and was. Uh, probably going to make its way to the United States. And um, I think I even talked to you, Kwame, about my son's yeah. study yeah. tour. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked about it because my uh, Rita and my son, Michael, was supposed to go to Italy 
uh, for his study tour. It's a big eighth grade trip. And um, when we saw the cases start coming in there, uh, it became obvious that that wasn't going to be able to happen. So um, we tried to uh, we tried to be as normal as we could. The, the, the rehearsal space is a, is a sacred and safe space, but it stopped feeling that way when every time you entered the uh, rehearsal room, you were running to the bathroom to wash your hands or apply sanitizer. Um, we, we artists, we are, we are physical in what we do, but also in terms of how we greet and how we show our love to one another. Um, we hug, we kiss, we, we, we love to feel the warmth of each other's physicality to express love and appreciation. And we stopped being able to do that. We had to be fist bumping and elbow bumping or just keeping our distance. I remember after one run through of the visitor, I was weeping and, I, and, my, and, and our, the actors wanted to come and, and hug me and I couldn't do it. It was very, very hard. So um, it, it, it suddenly became, because the visitor was, was, was going to have, we're gonna have our zits probe, which is what it's called when you present the orchestrations for the first time and the, and the cast sings. We were supposed to have it Friday, March 13th, and that was canceled. And there was one final moment that the cast shared the, uh, the morning of the 13th, and then everyone went on their separate ways. And we were told that we would be back hopefully in mid-April and um, we're still waiting to come back and still waiting to put on the show that we love. So it was, it was very challenging, um, but most importantly, we just wanted to make sure everyone felt safe. Um, and once it became apparent that people were getting nervous about being in the room and coming to rehearsal, um, everyone did the right thing. Kwame, what about for you? Um, actually, I felt like I was robbed twice. Um, and the rehearsal room was so beautiful. And I don't just say this, writing a book for a musical is, is, is a thing, but you know, it's about the music and listening to Tom's beautiful music every day. I would, I would go home on the subway just singing the songs every night. I loved being in that rehearsal room. I loved being inspired by the performers finding their way in and around and under melodies. And it was, it was, it was a really beautiful place. But also March 24th, the day we were due to open, is also my birthday. Oh. And so it was just like, I was like, oh, I'm opening up my beloved theater, the public, with this beloved piece um, on my birthday. And, um, and, and, and of, of course, COVID robbed us of that. Uh, you know, I, I would say everything that, that Tom said, you know, we, we artists, we love the haptic technology. We love the touching. And, um, and it became clear. I, I was actually due to fly back to New York on the 12th. And, uh, and then we kind of got the call and we were saying, no, I don't think we should do it. So it, it, it's a hard time to be an artist when, um, in particular at a, a time like this where our theatres are really our crucibles, our, our citadels to express our fears and our loves and our, and our reflections, you know, the, and, and to not have a theatre, to not have a, a place where we as artists can go at a catastrophic and historic moment such as this to articulate all of the hitherto things that I spoke to is, is quite hard. Hmm. Can you speak to how, as artists, you've been able to keep up your spirits or the momentum of the visitor? Is, is there a period right now where you look back on the script or on the music? Um, has it influenced you in any way to keep working on it, to keep the momentum up on the show? Or is it easier to, to put it on pause until there is the ability to, to launch again and to regroup together in a rehearsal room again? Kwame, you go first this time. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, actually, it's a brilliant question. Because for the first time, actually, in, 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 I think in my professional life, um, what happens always is you get to, a, to at the end of a run and everybody says, darling, I love you, darling, I love you so much. And we're gonna meet for tea next week and we're gonna hook up and you're gonna do it all that. And actually just the, the vagaries of, of existing like an artist means you don't really see them again until the next rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this, this group, this cast, and I think it's more than COVID. We still meet every Saturday by Zoom. 
we still connect, still feed each other, still are fed. And that, that's relatively remarkable that it's almost six months or more and we still meet on a Saturday. Um, and, and as for, well, certainly for me, you know, we were in a great place. I couldn't wait for the SITS probe. I couldn't wait to hear the orchestrations. And I, I and, you know, in a way, I think that, that, that uh, certainly for me, we did, you know, putting it on ice until, until such a day that we can open again. And they're literally picking up. And I know that we will because we gather every week. We will be able to just run back in and go, all right, where were we? And off we go. That's wonderful. I, I think for me, um, I, I, I suffered a real great loss that, that was hard for me. And, and I'm not saying anything that my wife, Rita, doesn't know. <laughs> but um, but at first I was, uh, tri I felt that I was going to be triumphant and I was going to be positive. And then the loss um, sort of seeped in and it was, it was hard for me emotionally to want to create. Um, because um, I just I just was feeling it in such a visceral way, and um, and those beautiful zooms every week that I'm now excited to rejoin. Kwame knows that I, I was involved in the beginning, and then I, I wasn't feeling so great actually. And there's all that question of whether being in New York at that time, whether we all were exposed and whether we had were, were dealing with COVID. I think a lot of us still still wonder. So. Um, so I, I, I sort of took an emotional break from everything because I needed to just sort of feel that loss. And, um, and then miraculously and thankfully, I, I've started to get my, my, uh, my juice back in terms of creating and, 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 um, and I'm excited to see, see friends again and excited to rejoin the Zoom. And I'm so, I'm so excited to hear that the Zoom has been happening because it really is a special cast. Um, we all feel such magic and love in the room. And I think also there's a great sense of purpose and privilege to tell the story that Tom McCarthy mm -hmm. created. And every, since I've been working on The Visitor, which was in, in, in 2014, uh, Brian and I wrote our first songs for it. Every time we get together, we keep talking about the world and how sadly The Visitor is becoming even more relevant. It's always been relevant. But I think now, especially in the world, it has, um, uh, I think my dog has just made an appearance, sorry about that. But it has a, um, it has a, 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 a true relevance that we feel and we are desperate to return to and bring to the world. Um, and, and it's a privilege to, to be sharing the story with, with Kwame and being in the rehearsal room with him is just a joy because of the energy and also I learn every day from what he's bringing as an artist um, and like he said, we're going to pick right up. Our set is in the theater, and um, and the energy is there, and 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 the, um, the the urgency to tell the story is even more so. So um, it's going to be quite emotional when we do get to come back. Well, we can't wait for that. <laughs> um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kwame. Um, so. I realized that no one's seen The Visitor. I mean, I obviously had such a, a wonderful privilege to see different um, run-throughs of it. Um, but for those who have seen the film, you may know the film by Tom McCarthy, there's so many beautiful themes in this film. And, and yes, um, it is becoming almost more relevant with the time that we're in right now. Um, but one of those themes is really about loneliness and isolation. Um, Walter, experiences that certainly as a central character um, and some of the beauty of the story is is the connection the human connection that is made in in the most unexpected places um, and I'm wondering if you can um, speak a little bit about how we have all changed in terms of the social isolation that we have um, had to um, live with um, and how you think that this story may resonate differently now with audiences who have experienced isolation, who maybe had not before. Um, I'm just curious how, how you can speak uh, to that. Tom, I'll, 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 I'll jump in if I may. Um, 
I, I, I thought it was so eloquent and beautiful what, what Tom said about, um, about how hard this, this isolation, how hard this ripping us from our normal, you know, the, the normals up and downs of our, of our day and of our year and of our environment, how hard it is emotionally. Um, you know, and, and I would say, you know, I'm relatively blessed, like you, like you guys, you know, I, I live with my children and my family and, you know, I'm, I'm used to being up here in my garrick writing anyway. So when we went into lockdown, the first couple of, um, the first couple of weeks, I was like, I, hey, you know, this is great. I, I can just get down and finish a new play or a new script and I can just get in. And then as it extended, I, I began to feel isolated from the world. They say it takes six weeks before you start getting used to and to whatever your new environment is. And I remember someone came to my house and it was an accident. And I'm a real friendly guy, as Tom will say. I love hugging, kissing. I love, you know, I'll, I'll do all that haptic stuff like at a, at a drop of a hat. And this guy came to my house and he said, Mr. Kweyama. And he went to hug me and I jumped. And I went, ah. And I went, who am I? Who have I become? I'm afraid of people. And I walked down the street and my constitutionally allowed one hour of exercise and no one was looking at each other. And everybody was, we were giving each other wide berths, but it was kind of a quick look and a look away. And so that everyone was being afraid of everyone else. And I was like, this is my definition of hell. This is, this is loneliness even when you're amongst the people. And so actually, I think you're absolutely right that, that, that the isolation that Walter feels, the loneliness, the fundamental loneliness, far more people would have experienced this post the pandemic than before. All of us now, you know, I, and again, I'm so blessed that I live with my family, but the notion of not being able to leave my home or see people or only see them in you know, in one or two dimensions on Zoom, well, that's going to affect our mental health for a, for a, for a while. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, beautifully said. And um, we, uh, this character uh, undergoes an isolation because of grief and loss. Um, and what's at the center of the visitor is the connecting, the reconnecting through these extraordinary people that he meets. Um, and one of the things that we celebrate in The Visitor is uh, it's taken from the film, and it's something that, that happens with musicians. It's called the drum circle, where everybody gets on a percussion instrument and they play together. And it's a beautiful moment in this show. Uh, Brian and I actually wrote a song um, for this moment. And it's something that the cast uh, did all the time for warm up or to connect. And it's the last thing that they did in the room before we said our goodbyes. I didn't get to, to, to be there, sadly, um, but uh, I think they recorded it. And, um, and I think about that a lot because even when Walter is alone from that point on, he feels the presence of the people that he's been moved by. And I think that, as Kwame said, that is that has been a huge loss for all of us. I went to my parents' house. It was the first time I had been out um, of New York City um, back, I think, in June. So, so this was from March to June. We, we weren't, uh, we hadn't left New York City. And there were days, I mean, I, I remember I didn't leave my apartment for 17 days because I was in a, in a panic about, about things. Um, and I remember my mom just, just, there was this, my own mother, me and we were deciding whether we could actually hug each other. And I was afraid to hug my own mom and I burst into tears and then I just kind of hugged her and it felt so wonderful and so scary. And, and how crazy that this pandemic, as Kwame said, turns us into, uh, into that, that we are afraid of people and people that we've greeted our whole lives suddenly have to be at a distance. Um, so, I, I do think that this piece speaks to that. And I think the catharsis of these characters will be our catharsis in the theater. And I know for me, and I hope for our audiences, it will be quite powerful and moving.
Uh, Tom, I have to tell you, um, there was a, a documentary um, here on the BBC, which kind of followed a year of my life. Uh, actually, a couple of years of my life when I left Baltimore to come back to London. And it ends with the drum circle that we recorded in the rehearsal room. And you see all of the cast just dancing and David playing and everybody just, and it, it was a really, really beautiful way. Look, I got into goosebumps. It was a really beautiful way to end, to end that documentary. Um, the, the magic of the drum circle, the magic of, you know, not just, not, not, not just the, the song and not just the physical, but the spiritual bonding that happens when, when the frequencies of the drum and of the voice and of the human spirit all combine. It's, it's beautiful. And, and it really is an ensemble energy and show. And that's why when we were talking about the clip that we wanted to share today, I wanted to make sure that you could see how the ensemble feeds our characters. And uh, again, as Kwame said, it's just, it's just so wonderful that this cast that easily could have sort of fallen away as we can when we're in isolation, that, that six months in is, is finding their relationships to be as important and vital. And, and um, certainly I, I love that, that we are a part of that as creators, bringing them together, but it speaks to their humanity and beauty as people and as artists. Um, Kwame and Tom, you both spoke so beautifully about the, the visceral impact of what it is to be a, a creative artist working together in a rehearsal room together and how physical a form that is. Um, can you speak a little bit about during this pandemic, this lockdown, this time of isolation, how artists have been able to come together um, in, in new and inventive ways? Um, has, has there been sort of a, a, a reimagining of how we communicate music, communicate the arts? Um, are, are artists still able to bring us together despite the challenges that this lockdown has given all of us. Who wants to go? <laughs> go. Tom? Oh, okay. I like following you. I know, I know, but I'm like going to be but I start the last two times. You should start this time. <laughs> uh, 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 You're smarter um, than me, so you go first. No, I, I don't think so at all. Uh, uh, yes, yes. You know, the, the, the job of the artist, right, is to, is to see the cracks and then to escalate. And I think that, that we have seen, not just online, the online work, but I think we have seen in the community work that is being done in theatres across the world, the way that the artist has been able to use their God-given gifts to communicate and to make and to, and to help. And I think we've certainly seen it, you know, the subscriptions on every screen, uh, streaming device has gone up by a billion percent and you know and and you know who wish they didn't have shares in netflix or zoom at this moment but you know but actually what we've realized is is that the artist has been doctor that the artist has been has been therapist that the artist has been carer you know it, it has helped guide us through so i'm really excited about not just the not just what new art forms will come from this, but actually how empowered the artist will be to when we are given the go, to race at creating a new tomorrow. The, 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 the angst and the pain and the, the need to express ourselves will be made manifest in a way that we have not felt, you know, in a long, in a long, long time. And a friend of mine said, you know, after Oliver Cromwell closed down the British theatres, which is the only time theatres has been closed as long in, in Britain, um, you know, what came out of it was the restoration comedy. Mm. Actually, it was a bombastic form, a form that just celebrated itself in a repressed society like Britain. It celebrated its sexuality and its, and its intimacy and it, in a bawdy and fantastic way. And I think we're going to see the equivalent of that. We are going to push boundaries. Beautiful. I Tom, agree. do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think that um, it's hard to know specifically what, what will come out of, of all of this. But I do think that 
um, we it, it's going to be uh, glorious and um, when it happens, there'll be a sense of, oh, oh yeah, this was the movement. And this is this is what the simmering, uh, this is what kind of simmering was happening while everyone was was, was in this lockdown moment and feeling um, the pent up frustration. Um, and also there, there, the world is changing in, 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 in important um, and beautiful ways, um, you know, every day. And, and artists are speaking to that, artists are sharing. Um, it's, uh, it's incredible to see how people are, are, are reaching one another and the artist is staying at the center of that. I remember, um, Rita, your aunt uh, sent me a video early on that somebody conceived for Zoom. And I, I, I wish I could remember the name of the song, um, but it was incredible because these, these nine dancers were, 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 were reaching. So if I'm reaching this way, suddenly my hand would go in the next frame. And, and it, was, it, was, it was the way that they did it, 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 it was just so brilliant. And I thought, yeah, the ingenuity is there. The, 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 the desire to make something of this moment is there. Um, so I think that we've all been finding ways to express ourselves. And all that being said, there is still, when it comes to theater, that thing of us being in a space. There's the person in, at the piano playing for the voice. There yeah. are instrumentalists sharing a small corner, a string quartet and making music with one another. There's an audience feeling the power of people in a space, seeing the sweat and the spit as they get emotional. And those are the things that we talk about, we go away and we, and we remember. And I think that's the thing that even though we can do so much right now with technology and with our own, with our own desire and um, motivation, um, it's, it's really, we're missing that, that final piece of being together. And uh, when that happens, it's, it's just incredible to think of all the things we, we take for granted, walking into, uh, walking into a rehearsal room and greeting your friends. No, I know. Going over, seeing a group of singers learning a new piece of music together. And, Around uh, the piano. And, you know, and, like, like, like the, be the beauty of that, right? And you know, the beauty of it. The beauty of it and the tragedy of it is that so many of us were on our computers and our phones. Um, you know, I'm guiltiest at, at, at certain moments. And what I wouldn't give to be able to walk into a room, to, to walk into a room and, and experience 10 to six rehearsal with nothing but just a script and music in front of me to get to take it in from my fellow artists. And, and when that happens, I, I, I'm probably gonna be too emotional for words. <laughs> We can't wait. <laughs> so um, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, recent months have really broadened and sharpened the conversation about race, immigration, identity. Um, how do you think the visitor uh, touches on these issues? And, and um, how do you think that um, it will speak to us uh, now in this in this climate, uh, in light of these uh, new very important discussions that have been happening um, much more. So I'm going to let you go first. Okay. Um, it's 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 been uh, yes, it's it, it, it's been such an emotional and um, important time. Uh, as a father to see all of the important uh, and world-changing voices rising and, and calling for justice. And uh, it's, it's, it's just been so inspiring um, and also heartbreaking to see how we as people get to a certain place? How do we allow these things to happen? How, how are, 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 are we still hearing those voices cry out in the way that we've heard them cry out for years? Um, the Visitor was written as a response to 
um, I get, it's, uh, a lack of humanity, justice, um, the inability to see each other as human beings, and for um, for people who have beautiful people to get to live in this world as they want and as we need them to. Um, so the visitor, even before, was for me one of the most important things that I was getting a chance to add my voice to, to speak to that humanity and to be a lesson as to how we should live in this world. Um, and now uh, I feel even more of a privilege to tell the story and a hope that it will move people, it will move the needle in terms of discussion and conversation. It will light the way um, and show people true humanity and, and teach lessons for those who need to learn them. Um, and we've seen in this, in this country and in the world, but in, in this country, how polarizing things can be. And um, it's a very touchy thing because I have strong views and <laughs> I know that there are people who have equally strong views in other ways. Um, but I wanted to be an artist because I cried at a very early age from stories that touched me. And those stories were always about triumph. They were always about the recognition of humanity and people learning about one another. There's nothing better than a good cry when you see a resolution that just feels so cathartic. Um, and those are the kinds of things that I live for and I want to bring to the world. And I want the visitor to make people feel that and to walk out of that feeling hopefully a little more enlightened. Again, as an artist, it's never for me to say, well, I'm writing this story, I'm writing this musical, so here's how you're going to feel. It's a similar thing with Next to Normal when I said, I, I am very moved by that story. I hope people will feel the way that I do. Um, so um, this, is, this, is, this is as important a time as I've ever lived in. And The Visitor as important a piece as I've ever worked on. And um, I've wanted it to speak to the world and I hope that it will continue to speak and it will speak to this moment that we're in. Um, and uh, as I said, teach us about humanity and, and also just shed light on beautiful people in the world and how they teach all of us how we should live. Thank you. I, I, would, I would say, and, and actually, sorry, Tom, for throwing you under the bus on that quite difficult question, first of all. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I, I, I wanted you, you know, I, I wanted you to go first because you introduced it to me. I didn't see the film the first time around. And when I was called about it and I saw the film, I said, yes, please, with my whole heart. As you know, I, I was a huge fan, am a huge fan of Next to Normal. And, and the empathy that, that you and Brian excavated in that. That's the word. Um, That's the great word. I mean, literally just, just, just moved me. Um, but what I would say is, I would say that this time that we have just lived through um, and are still living through vis-a-vis -vis Black Lives Matter. I think one of the things that, that, that I have noticed is that it has deepened the listening of my white friends and colleagues. Um, of course, within the black community globally, you know, the question is how long will that deeper listening last for? But it's churlish to not say that we have witnessed a deeper listening. And I think that that's what Walter actually is. Walter listens deeply in a way he hadn't heard before. And that, I think, will make audiences actually post-pandemic or the triple threat of the pandemic, Black Lives Matter and insecurity of the, of, of the theater sector. When this play, this musical, I believe, will cut deeper because he listens deeper and we will recognize that deeper listening in ourselves and our colleagues. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. 
Um, Kwame, I, I want to ask you specifically a, a question briefly, and I'm, I'm minded of time, but um, the, the theaters are sustaining such a, a devastation right now in terms of can they even survive? And um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you can speak a bit, um, you know, from your perspective as an artistic director of how, how will these theaters survive? What the artists are going through right now, facing unemployment, um, not being able to even provide for their own livelihood, let alone mm. the artistic health of, of, of small theaters, of large theaters, um, can you speak to um, how institutions are rising to the occasion, um, how they will survive, thrive, and really what everyone can, can do to help support creatively, financially? What do we need to do? Well, I, again, I think it's a brilliant question. And, and, and of course, it is both the same and slightly different between the United States and, and, and Britain. Mm -hmm. and, and if I may take, take a moment just to frame up the British way that what's happening here, again, similarly, you know, March 12th, we were shut down with the first ones out and possibly the last ones back in. The devastation that that has caused, in particular for our freelancers, um, those who make up 70% of the theatre workforce are freelance creative artists. And many of them have fallen between, between the cracks of our welfare system here. Um, you know, some of us, we, we've been fortunate in that we've been given a thing called the Job Creation Scheme, which allowed um, us to maintain and look after our administrative staff for um, up until November, actually. Um, but many of our freelancers have fallen through the cracks. So one of the major things that we're really worried about is, um, you know, when we all get the go to go again, be it April of next year or whatever that is, um, will we actually have the creatives that we all need to create the work that serves the rest of humanity when their humanity has been stripped and I mean and ripped apart? We're talking maybe 13 or 14 months for some people who may not have earned, who may not be able to pay their mortgages or their rents and might as well um, improve their craft. So it's, it's, it's relatively catastrophic. I think for most of our institutions in this country, again, we had a thing called um, the Cultural Recovery Fund, which many of us are, are applying for in order to get us, to help us limp through to April of next year, um, if indeed April is the time that we'll be able to reopen. So it's, um, you know, and, and hopefully we'll get some of that money, but it'll only get us to April and then we'll be at the cliff edge again. So it's precarious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, and, and so, you know, it really is quite simple. The, the, the way to help is to donate. Mm -hmm. And the whole world is suffering. Um, but for those who may have just, you know, a, a little cushion and love this art form, you know, it is, it is, you know, find the way to find your local theater, wherever you are in the United States or in England and donate. Your thousand dollars, your five hundred dollars, your one hundred dollars, or your couple of million, um, will actually be a lifeline for your community, not just the thing that happens on the stage. Because we're more than just the thing that happens on the stage. We are community workers. Mm -hmm. So true. Thank you. Um, and, and Tom, just just briefly, um, you know having experienced this as an artist um, and this shocking, shocking time, um, how can you uh, say that your time at Columbia, did it prepare you at all for this setback, this challenge, this, um, this uh, very unique experience? Can you, can you tie that in at all to your experience as a, a student at Columbia? Well, I think that, uh... Columbia was the best four years of my life in terms of education and in terms of me finding myself and knowing the kind of person that I wanted to be. It's where I found theater, it's where I found Rita. Uh, and um, it, 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 uh, it, it definitely gave me a, a newfound work ethic, confidence. Um, I was a bit of a mess when I got to Columbia. I was kind of a procrastinator 
Um, I always liked a good Yankee or Knicks game as opposed to my studies. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I became uh, a, a serious person at Columbia. Um, and and uh, I, it's, it, it was through the student body because there, I've heard people talk about college and could you just do it? Do you need to go to college? Um, and certainly I, my heart breaks for the students that aren't able to experience this right now because what happens besides just this, the education and the classes you take is you learn from your fellow students. Mm -hmm. I learned how to be a student. I learned how to study. I, and, and, and I also learned about myself, things about not taking myself so seriously, learning to laugh at myself, learning how to, how to, how to experience something in New York City and write about it. Um, I, I don't know who I would be. I, I wrote If Then um, because I really could have gone in different, gone different roads. And I wonder if all those roads would have taken me to where I am, which is an artist writing for the theater. Um, I'm not sure if I hadn't met you and you hadn't introduced me to Brian and, um, and we wrote those varsity shows that, that, that I would be sitting here with Kwame talking about mm. And, and talking about another score that I've written with the brilliant Brian Yorkie um, for the, uh, you know, for, for to have the dream come true of working at the public theater. So um, Columbia to me really was the place where my, my life began. And I knew what I wanted to do from an early age in terms of music, but it was at Columbia that everything came together. Um, in terms of where, where I am right now, Certainly, I feel the sense of community. I feel like I'm not alone because I'm a part of Columbia, and especially here in New York City, I feel their presence and love. Um, so uh, I don't, I, I don't think anything can prepare us for what we're going through. We we've never lived through anything like this. But the more that we can rely on the solid relationships that we've made, the communities that we've built. Um, we feel that we're not alone and we feel every day that we are a step closer to getting past it. And we're doing that with people who care about us. And um, that's been something that's really sustained me through this time. Thank you. Um, Tom, you, you had the opportunity to create something very special for Columbia this year. Um, you wrote a new alma mater song that was um, debuted at the 2020 virtual commencement um, really for all the graduates that were not able to be present together. Um, so we're going to, um, the song was sung by Ben Platt, Broadway star, uh, Tony winning Broadway star, also a Columbia alum from general studies who's a student there. Um, and um, I, we're going to play a little uh, clip from the song now. anything to be by your side. I travel the world both far and wide through gathering storms and the rising tide. Columbia, oh Columbia. That's lovely. <laughs> That beautiful. Um, it's nearly as beautiful as your husband saying he came to college to find you. <laughs> <laughs> I I would put them on par. I hope this is being recorded. Maybe <laughs> for your kids in like you know like twenty years, and they'll be like, oh, am I ever gonna get love like that? And then in about thirty years, they'll be like, look at my mom and dad. Oh, are they sweet? I want it anyway. I know I want. I'm going to play it to my kids. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think, uh, Tom, um, can you just very briefly tell us about what it was like writing that song during this pandemic? And then we're going to go. We have some questions uh, that I'm going to go to um, from our audience. Uh, it was uh, writing that song was a great gift because it was the first thing that I had done creative. I feel um, in 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 weeks. I wrote some stuff at the beginning, but but I had spent a, uh, many weeks just feeling stuck and sad, and and then uh, 
and then that gift came to me to write the song and um, it's something I'm really proud of. I wanted to create something that would speak to the students. I wanted to create something that um, hopefully would, 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 would be a song people would go back to. Um, and I know that San Susi, the beautiful alma mater that I sang with many times with the Columbia Kingsmen, the acapella group I was in, I re-examined those lyrics in the pandemic. What if tomorrow brings sorrow or anything other than joy? Um, what if be wintry chill, rainstorm or summer's thrill? Tomorrow is the future still, this is today suddenly those lyrics have a whole new motion and meaning. Um, and I wanted to draw on that for this song and talk about there's, there's so much to love about Columbia, but there's a sadness and we're mourning that we're not together graduating. That I, I do anything to be by your side, that's Columbia. That's my fellow classmates walking, getting to walk to our graduation. So um, I'm very proud of that. And uh, I look forward to the students getting to sing that together in, in common space in years to come. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So we're going to go through a couple questions that have come through to our chat. Uh, and the first one, and Kwame or Tom, um, you know, feel free to jump in. Uh, but the question is, how do you find inspiration now in the time of COVID when there are so few experiences that exist to inspire? I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, uh, I'm a hardwired optimist and I love human beings and my experience of human beings for the last 52 years has filled me up several times over. So now is the time I can just dip back into that reservoir. I can close my eyes and I can just remember and I can dream forward and I can remember backwards. I, you know, it, that, the, 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 it, it is not just about the external or the immediate, the here and now. It, it, it's, it's about the things that we stand for. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And everything that I am now is, is, is the result of things that I have stood for. So it, it, feels, con it feels concrete still. It, it, you know, maybe come ask me that question maybe in four years time when I've replayed every inch and reread every book in my house. <laughs> and looked at, every, <laughs> looked at every new Netflix show that there could possibly ever be. You know, that, that, then, I, then I might run out. But uh, in the meantime, um, you know, I, I, I think my spirit running over them with the human spirit that I've experienced in my life. Thank you. Tom, did you want to add anything there? That's a beautiful answer. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's the, the, the brilliant writer it is, because the gift of language and how to express, it's just, it's gorgeous. Um, yes. I, I, as I said, it was it's it was it's very challenging for me um, because because for me creating comes from such a positive safe space and and it's been hard to feel that way especially as as Rita knows we we had a endured a flood uh, at the top at the beginning of the pandemic and it destroyed my studio and had to be rebuilt and so the space that I was creating in suddenly was not a safe space literally. Oh my um, God! I didn't know that. Sorry. So so that's that's been that was challenging. Um, and uh, I, I think a couple things. One is, is my family and, and wanting to, to express and write for my kids because I have to keep their inspiration and spirits up. And um, I wrote a song for Michael's graduation. I've written a song for Julia. Charlie's okay. Charlie's eight and Charlie's just running around watching. He may even <laughs> um, but, but really to create something that will sustain my children and show them that you can find um, you can find joy and inspiration in even the most challenging times. Uh, and the other thing that I'm really excited about that I'm doing and has brought me great inspiration is that I, 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 I decided, you know, someone, as we've been talking in this big moment, wanting to express art about all that we're seeing and feeling, this is a moment that's bigger than any one of us. And I took that literally and said, I wanna create something with my fellow artist to take their stories and their feelings about this and to collaborate with them and create songs. So I have this group of incredible artists that have written me testimonials about how they're feeling, you know, all different issues and moments and thoughts. And I'm creating a song cycle that's gonna become an album. And uh, I've already, I'm, I'm now three songs in and um, I, I, I have some beautiful things that are on my desktop just waiting for me to get to them. But I wrote a song today um, and, and, and that feels like an equally huge privilege just to say, I want to learn, I want to I, I, I share in this emotion with you, and let's create something together that we're both feeling. 
Um, and, and we can look back on and say this was something that came out of this time in a positive way to enlighten us as artists and to enlighten the people that experience it. And Rita, sorry to jump back in. I'm so inspired by that, Tom, I, I have to say. Um, uh, very interesting. I, I, I've written something during lockdown and, um, and then I put it away for about a, a month before I went back to it. And it was really specific. It was about the first three weeks of lockdown. And, uh, and when I went back two months later, there were so many things that I had forgotten mm. about early lockdown, about the first two or three weeks. We now just speak about it like it's just this one thing. But it's really been a Corona coaster, you know? And, <laughs> and, you know, and there's the time when you're at the top and the other time you're holding onto the side and, and you're rolling and, and dipping with it. And, and actually writing about the first three weeks um, really, really reminded me that, that art is kind of brilliant. And the human mind is wonderful. We forget painful things quite quickly, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, and, and I think we, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a beautiful time on the flip back, remembering specificities yeah. of our time. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just wanted to share that. No, no I, 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 I created a journal a couple of weeks into, I, I went away from it, but the first few weeks, and I'm, I haven't gone back to it, but I'm, I'm sure it's still exactly what you just described. Yeah, it's weird. It's so funny how much we forget. Yes. Um, so another question, it, 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 this is uh, uh, from a young aspiring artist. Um, so Broadway seems to have a significant promise for a recovery. Um, what do you think of the recovery for the off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway worlds and what they'll look like in the next five years? Um, and this is especially for young artists who are looking to how do we, how do we get involved? How will we find work in the arts? Um, if those that are already established are struggling and are trying to make ends meet, what, what advice or guidance can we give to the young artists there who are really just emerging on this journey in this extraordinary time? It's a really good question. Um... I think, and, and Kwame described himself a little while ago as the, as the optimist, right? I got that right. You said that word. I said hardwired optimist. Yeah. Hard, hardwired optimist. So uh, I, I am too. And, and my feeling is it's, it, it's about the virus in, right now. I mean, that's the thing that's been so difficult. And, and, and you know, especially in, in, in this country, um, we in New York, we went this and, and now we're here and, and, but there's still the precariousness because we're all kind of doing different things. You can, you can feel it just being out and about. Um, and, and it's, I feel like when, when that happens and we are able to start to bring more things back, all of these artists are still there. Everyone wants to work in theater who, who did before. Um, as Kwame said, it's, it's quite precarious in terms of the sustainability of these institutions and they need to be supported. Um, but my hope as the optimist is that when it's safe to do so, we will be able to come back and Broadway and off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway and, and the development process and, and, and workshops, and all of these different things will come back because People want to be writing and working together and creating this kind of art. Um, so, so it's going to take time, obviously, and 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 I can't even imagine what the toll has been and what what it will be when 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 all is said and done. Um, but I think the worst thing that we can think is um, this is over. We're in a, we're in a place where we can't come back. You have to think about doing something else. Um, art is as important as ever, and theater is going to be as important as ever. I can't speak to when it's gonna come back, but these scientists are doing extraordinary things. The, the, the amount that they're, that they're accomplishing in the shortest amount of time, I mean, it's, it's just, it's extraordinary. I was, I was talking with Cameron Crowe, who I am working on Almost Famous with, and how you know there was this period in the 60s when all these great bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan and the Birds, they were all feeding off one another. And it seems like in science, we're in that moment where just anything's possible. 
and and they're working at at, at incredible speeds. Um, you know, my my hat goes off. It's in awe of, of of what's being accomplished, and no one knows when that will be. But 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 that's what I feel like is going to be the key: is that we can all come together and be together safely. And when that happens, I feel like it's going to be an outpouring of of, of creativity and people wanting to get back to, to, to being part of theater because that's what we love. So um, it'll probably be a, a gradual thing, but but my hope as the optimist is that all those things will come back. Um, so, so, so keep doing what you're doing, keep writing, keep dreaming, keep studying. Um, there's gonna be a place for all that and it's gonna be as important as ever for your art to get into the world and for you to express yourself. I would, I would, I would, say, I would agree with everything that, that that Tom just said. I pointed that way as if he's that way on your Zoom as well. But alas, <laughs> um, and, and I would say we are amid the fog, but fog clears. You just have to believe that it will. You have to keep yourself trim, keep your instrument sharp. Make sure that if you're an actor, make sure that your voices you keep working on your voice and you keep reading the plays and you keep understanding why writers were writing what they were writing and what the writers will write for tomorrow. Just, you know, you've got to keep intellectually nimble. If you're a singer or a musician, you've got to keep the instrument moving and getting ready so that when the fog clears, you're not, you're not waiting, but you're there ready for every opportunity. And the opportunities will come because the fog will clear. History has taught us that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love that image when the fog clears. I'm going to hold on to it. Um, we have one last question, um, bringing it back to the visitor. Um, can you speak a little bit about the process of adapting a film to musical? And um, how is the musical different uh, from the film? Does the writer want to go first? <laughs> I, I, I appreciate being thrown under the bus for that one as well. It's good. As well. <laughs> well, I would say this. I was very, very blessed. Um, that I, I I received a draft that, um, that, 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 that of course had been worked on by, by, by Tom and Brian before I got to the project. So um, there was already a framework and my job when I was invited into the process, and, and I'm ever thankful for that. Um, it was, was to kind of look at it and kind of go, um, what do you, when you've got such glorious music, how much book do you need? What is the form of the structure of the evening? Is it, when, we, when I first got it, it was in two acts, we went, well, no, let's just jam it and just go all the way through. What's the momentum? And the, the songs are so beautiful that, that when I first read it, I went, why am I, why am I even writing in this? Why? There's nothing to do. Just sing those songs and go home and collect your Tony. Um, and, but, but, I, but I think one of the beautiful things about having source material, and, and in a serious way actually, is that you have to ignore that it's a source material. You have to look at it, you have to take it in, you have to do, um, you have to be, you have to honor it, and then you've got to go, this is mine. Because if you don't make it yours, you're just going to ape what was done before. And it's a completely different form. One note that's sung from Tom's score is the equivalent of four scenes that could be written. And you have to understand that when you're adapting. It's, it's now ours. That's beautifully said and, and exactly right. Because if you're going to adapt anything, um, you want to be able to put your voice into it. And, and especially as a musical, um, it has to sing. It has to find its new voice in the art form. And um, movies um, have, a, have a certain structure to them, not all of them, but um, I've worked on an, a, a, some different film adaptations and um, sometimes the thing that a movie builds to, the third act, the, the more plot, the drive, musicals at the end want to become more still. You want to you suddenly focus in and because we're all expecting 
that big moment where the, where the character sings their what we call the 11 o'clock number. Um, and what was great about The Visitor was it had so much stillness in it already. It had so many places that stopped for what I felt was, was song and, and we could really make our own. And it also has a musical element to it um, already. So we could take advantage of that as well. The djembe, the, the, the drum lessons, the drum circle. Um, that's been thrilling to get to work with as well. Um, you know, films also have, you can get away in a film with a character showing up for five minutes and then going away. <laughs> Those are as a musical because when you're doing a musical, it's like, okay, if you, if you create that character, then you have to hire someone to play that part. And if they're only in the show for five minutes, so one character, I think it was Marion Seldes who played Walter's piano teacher. And we wrote so many piano lesson songs. I don't know, Kwame, how many of them you heard, if you heard any of them. I heard a few of them, said, yep. And you finally, after, you know, your fifth reading, you think we're not getting as much as we hoped. And we're also having to justify a character that really doesn't exist in the musical for, for that long. So to answer the question specifically that, that was asked, that's a place where we decided we wanted to establish Walter and the piano, but we're doing it in a completely different way and an emotional way. Because the big thing about the piano is that it was his wife's instrument. And his wife was a, was a, was a concert pianist and he has recordings of her. And that's the thing that we have to establish. And, um, uh, and and I think that we're doing that. You know, we should also mention our brilliant director, Dan Sullivan. Yes! This is Dan's, um, I think, first musical, at least. Um, I, I, I think if you ask Dan, he would say, I've directed musicals before, but um, but I think this is the first one in, in, in a while. And, and he, he had been, he says he'd been thinking about whether he would do one or wanting to. And I was working with Dan doing Shakespeare in the Park um, and, and Dan, as a director of Shakespeare in the Park, is so musical and so instructive. And I just said, have you ever thought of directing a musical? I, I, I've been working on this piece, The Visitor. And thankfully, he jumped on board. And, um, and Dan has found this way to express Walter and, and, and that grief and, and the recognition of the piano and what it means in his life. So I think that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to be faithful, but allow ourselves for an adaptation and a new musical. And that's brought many really exciting discoveries as well. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Tom. Um, we can't wait until the theaters open again. Um, and we can't wait to all be in the room again together. Um, you've inspired us so much this evening. And uh, to the Columbia community, thank you so much for, for attending uh, uh, today and for joining us. Um, I want to uh, just um, alert you to next week's Columbia at Home, um, and the title of that is Antarctica, Sea Level and Animals. This is a family program, so please bring the children if you'd like. It's an adventure with science and watercolor with uh, Dr. Indrani Das of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, it's at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on September 16th, and you can register at alumni.columbia.edu. Um, once again, um, Kwame, Tom, thank you so much for taking your time uh, to speak with us today, and we wish you all um, all the best, and everyone, please stay safe and stay connected and stay connected with us here at Columbia. So goodbye and thank you, and, and everyone stay well. Thank you for asking me, and I'm really jealous that I didn't go to Columbia now. <laughs> you can always come back. I'm happy to. It's coming. <laughs> now an honorary So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.